diepte van die rijkdom, wijsheid, kennis van God. Hoe ondergrondelijk is die oordelen? Onaspeerlijk is die wee. Van wie die gedachten van God geken, of wie was zijn raadsman geweest, of wie het iets aan hom gegee, dat het hom vergeld zo so wordt. Maar uit u en tot u is alle dingen. Isen is die heerlijkheid voor alle eeuwigheid. Anoint these lips of clay, Lord, as I speak to your people that are in pain. I speak to a community that are in pain. Our hearts are ripped apart. But we ask for your strength tonight in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to thank Dr. Carl and Pastor Joan, my leaders, for the opportunity to minister the Word of God. Definitely not an easy occasion to do this. Um, and I don't take this moment lightly. I want to greet the clergy, everybody that is here, the bishops, apostles, pastors, evangelists, and teachers, everyone from government. Thank you so much for coming out and celebrating this beautiful life. Then again to Cherise, children, and the family. May the Lord be our strength in this time. Our time is a little fast spent, so I want to try and be quick. Can we please read with me in the book of Luke chapter 7? I want you to navigate there if you have your Bibles. If not, you can follow on the screen. Luke chapter 7 from verse 18. Our lesson of life is found in this 7th chapter from verse 18 and it reads as follows. Then the disciples of John reported to him concerning all these things. And John calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus saying, Are you the coming one or do we look for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, Are you the coming one or do we look for another? And that very hour he cured many of the infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and so many blind he gave sight. Jesus answered and said to them, Go tell John the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. God bless the reading of his word. As we hang out here in Luke chapter 7, which is also parallel to Matthew chapter 11 this evening, I want to talk and teach and preach about one thing. The title is, When Life is Difficult. Don't your neighbor say, When Life is Difficult. Let me just say here this evening that right now in my life I'm trying to grow and be the best me that I can be like each and every one of us. At this stage of my life, um, especially when you reach this age over 50, that you realize you've got some flaws and some failures and some wrinkles that you have to iron out and some stuff that you're trying to fix. So now and then I appreciate it when I'm called into my senior's office and for me to grow better because then he speaks to me. And one of the things that I've noticed about myself at this stage of my life that my colleagues can easily attest to as one of my flaws, my shortcomings and one of the wrinkles I need to iron out is that I'm very petulant. Yes, I'm an impatient person. I have to confess every now and then people can really get on my nerves. Although I've got a smile on my face sometimes. Although I'm a little older now and uh, I don't say the stuff that I used to say. So I'm growing in that area. It's quickly evident on my face when you, when you are getting on my nerves. And, and I, I give you that look that lets you know that. So 
So I'm trying to work on being patient. I'm learning to be more patient with people. So in one uh, session with my senior, he suggested that I take note of what frustrates me or what irritates me or what gets on my nerves because you cannot work on being patient until you know the buttons that make you impatient. And so I've started taking note of what frustrates, irritates, and gets on my nerves. And I came to the conclusion that one of the things that frustrates, irritates, aggravates, and gets under my skin is when I have to repeat myself. I don't like having to say something twice, Ansley. And you know what aggravates me the most. You have to pray for me, beloveds, please. It aggravates me when people ask me questions that they should know the answer to. If, if they have been paying attention to what I was saying. Uh, listen, beloved, I know I have to grow and I'm working on it. But if you ask a question that you should know the answer to, if you were paying attention, it lets me know that when I was speaking to you, you were not paying attention. And so when I speak, you should be listening. I have to grow in that area, I know. But it aggravates me when people are not listening to what I'm saying and they... And they ask questions that they should know the answer to. Now before you judge me tonight. Let me just tell you that makes me a little like Jesus. Because if you look at the, hum the humanity of Jesus. You will see that Jesus seemingly gets aggravated when people ask questions they should know the answer to. If they were listening to what he has been saying. If you don't believe that, you should reread Luke chapter 7 a little bit. You'll find out that Jesus shows a little frustration with what goes down there. In Luke chapter 7, John the Baptist sends two of his disciples to Jesus to ask the question. Are you the coming one? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one we've been waiting on? Are you the one Isaiah prophesied about? John the Baptist wants to know, is Jesus the coming one? Now, if you read your Bible, you will know that this is a very curious question coming from John the Baptist. Because if anyone should have known who Jesus was, it was John the Baptist. As a Bible reader, you remember that in Luke chapter 1, the story of the birth of Jesus, that Jesus and John are cousins. You recall that when Mary finds out that she is pregnant with Jesus, she goes to see Elizabeth who's pregnant with John. And when a pregnant Mary and a, in, in G, when a pregnant Mary with Jesus in her womb walks in the presence of a pregnant Elizabeth with John the Baptist in her womb, the Bible says that John gives an embryonic praise and does some backflips in his mother's womb because even in the womb John knew who Jesus was that same John goes into the wilderness and begins to preach and proclaim Jesus so the John who knew him in the womb is the John who preached about him in the wilderness and if that was not enough in Luke chapter 3 one day John is down by the river Jordan busy baptizing people Jesus shows up and says John I need you to baptize me John says I'm not worthy to be baptized I, I'm not worthy to baptize the son of God but Jesus convinces him anyway and he does it he baptizes him and after he pulls him up a dove descends from heaven and the voice of God in the presence of John the Baptist says, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. John knows Jesus in the womb. He preaches about Jesus in the wilderness. He hears God speak by the water. And the question you need to be asking is, how can John who knew him in the womb, proclaimed him in the wilderness and heard about him at the water, now reach a place where he's unsure who Jesus is how can John have doubts about Jesus well part of the answer deals with the context of where John is when he sends this question 
The reason why John doesn't go to Jesus himself and ask, are you the coming one? Is because if you read the other synoptic gospels, you find out that when John asks this question, John is in jail. How did John the Baptist get there? I'm glad you asked. Herod, who is king, was married, married his own brother's wife. And everybody knows that's out of order. Nobody says anything but John the Baptist. Grootmond. John calls Herod out for what he knows is an act of Im immorality. John writes a blog, puts it on the internet, and it goes viral. Everybody knows about what Herod did. Herod is embarrassed, has John the Baptist arrested, only for Herod's stepdaughter to demand that John gets beheaded. And so now John is in jail under the death sentence, and while he is in jail, he now has doubts about who Jesus is. Because life can put you in such a hard place that you wind up having doubts about the goodness of God. Let me preach right here. It doesn't matter what your church title is. It doesn't matter how big your Bible is. It doesn't matter how many consecutive Sundays you come to church. Everybody in here can wind up in some circumstances that make you question whether God is who God said he was. I know you can't say amen because you want your neighbor to think that you are saved and sanctified and that you have it all together and that you wake up every morning with your mind stayed on Jesus. But there are some of us that can admit tonight that I've been in some tight situations that made me go to God and ask why did you let this happen to me when is this going to be over are you going to make a way will you take care of this has anybody ever questioned the goodness of God life can get so hard that it forces you to wonder about the God you worship. If God is God, why is this happening? If God can do whatever he wants, why not do what I ask? Somebody say that's a good question. And what's amazing about this question that John asks is that Jesus never answers it. John sends a simple question. I just need to know. Are you who I think you are? Jesus doesn't give a simple answer. Wouldn't it have just been easier. For Jesus just to say. Yes I am. Jesus doesn't answer because he needs to send a message to John. That when life is hard like that when you find yourself in locked up situations when you are wondering about the goodness of God you don't need an easy answer you need something deeper to hold your life together hear me beloved that when people are in rough seasons of life I can't stand church cliches I don't need easy answers. Can I be real here tonight? Every now and then, these easy answers get on my nerves. I know he may not come when, he want, when you want him to, but that's not helping me right now. I know that he won't put more on me than I can bear. That's not helping me right now. I know when the praises go up, the blessings come down. That's not helping me right now. Have you ever needed more than easy answers? Have you ever needed more than some cliches that have been rehearsed and microwaved a thousand times? Have you ever needed more than that? Jesus says when life gets hard, you need more than easy church answers. And so watch. What this text teaches us about what you need when life is hard on you. 
There are three things that every believer, every child of God needs when life is hard and then we're out of here. The first thing that you need, you need faith that is firm in days of disappointment. Let me teach Bible for a minute. The reason why John is questioning Jesus. Dr. Alan Culpepper, PhD in the New Testament says it's because John is wrestling with disappointment. He is the cousin of Jesus. Who has preached Jesus and was trying to do right. And wound up in jail. He preached Jesus to all the communities. But he wound up dead. And John is trying to figure out. How can I be your cousin? How can I preach your word? How can I try to do right? And I still wind up in jail. That this was not supposed to happen to me. Beloved, I've come to tell you tonight. That if you walk long enough with God. You will have some moments where you will go to God. And, and say to God. This was not supposed to happen to us. I wish I had some true people who can declare, listen, I'm trying to do right. Why did God allow this to happen? I come to church. This is not supposed to happen. I serve in ministry. This is not supposed to be the lot in my life. When you do right, it's hard to understand. How you get wronged. But here's what I've come by to tell you this evening. And it's a bitter pill to swallow. That when you walk faithfully with God like Ashwin did. There will be moments when God disappoints you. There will be some moments... That what you expect from God is not what you experience of God. That God doesn't answer prayers the way you want them to be answered. God doesn't move in times that you want him to move. I don't care how much you, your tithe is. I don't care how loud you can shout. You cannot force the hand of God to act in ways that are comfortable and convenient for you. In His sovereignty, God will oftentimes disappoint us. This is not for crutch people. This is not for the faint-hearted. This is for a growing believer. I'm telling you the truth that God doesn't always say yes. God doesn't always move the mountain. God doesn't always take the thorn out. God doesn't always make a way. God has a way of disappointing you. And you've got to have the faith that holds on to God. When God doesn't do what you thought God should do. You've got to have a faith. That can endure disappointments. Because real faith, beloved, is not expecting that God will do something. Real faith is believing in God when He doesn't do anything. Real faith is not just me expecting God to do great things. Real faith is when I trust in God. When God doesn't do great things when I hold on to God in spite of what happens to me when I believe in God when the bottom of my life drops out when I worship God without a cent in my pocket when I pray to God when I have a sickness in my body when I hold on to his hand no matter what I go through my real faith is seen when I trust God, even when God has disappointed me. That's why Jesus said, blessed is the one who's not offended because of me. 
Because I'm going to do some things that's going to upset you. I'm going to move in some ways that's going to leave a bad taste in your mouth. I'm going to answer your prayers in ways that you don't appreciate. I'm going to let some stuff happen to you that you didn't think should happen to you. And in that moment, don't be offended. Don't walk away, Sharice. Don't give up on God. Don't turn your back on me. I've got a plan. I'm up to something. I'm doing something in your life. I just need you to trust me. Is your faith firm when God disappoints you? It reminds me of a rural pastor who went to visit a member of his church. He goes into the country to a farm to visit. And as he approaches, there is on the stable a weather vane. There's a weather vane. An instrument that shows the direction of the wind. The weather vane has written on it, God is good. So the pastor and his member stands there and sees that God is good. But then the wind shifted and the weather vane moved. And where they were standing, they could no longer see that God is good. And the pastor said to the member, you know what? That is a theological inaccuracy for you to put God is good on the weather vane. Because you're suggesting that if the wind blows the right way, I can then only see that God is good. And the farmer said, no, pastor, that's not what it means. He said, I put God is good on the weather vane so that when, so that I will be reminded that no matter which way the wind blows, that God is still good. The wind doesn't have to be at my back for me to know that God is good. And no matter which way it goes that I can declare that God is good. I need about five people to say that no matter what happens in my life, my God is still good. When the bottom drops out, God is good. When daddy... Or hubby goes to glory. God is still good. When my money is funny. God is good. When the one that I love doesn't love me back. God is still good. You need a faith that is firm. In the day when you, God disappoints you. Number two. You need friends who are faithful witnesses of God's wonders. Mm, can I tell you what makes a hard situation worse? When you have the wrong people in your life. When life gets hard on you, you've got to be careful about who's in your inner circle. Some of you are messed up right now because you have the wrong people on speed dial. Let me tell you the kind of people you need. You need people like these two disciples whom John calls. These two disciples come to John. They take his question to Jesus and they bring, his, they bring Jesus' answer back to John. Let me tell you the type of people you need. You need people who you can be real with. Watch this now. Here is John the Baptist, the preacher, the elder, the bishop. With his re religious sanctified self. He is struggling with a relationship with God. Now who does the pastor speak to? When the pastor is having trouble with God. But John has two people in his life that he's comfortable enough with. Taking his title off and showing them that I'm just another brother who struggles with God just like you. Because everybody needs somebody who you can be real with and share what's really happening in your life. Let me tell you something. I am tired of religious environments where I have to pretend to be what I'm not. I'm tired of coming to church and having to act every week like I'm blessed and highly favored. That I woke up shouting, thank you, Jesus, every morning. No, there's some of us that can be real. There, there are some mornings when I come to church and giving God the glory was, the, was not on the top of my list. I felt like I was losing my mind and I just need a place where I can be real about my struggles. 
But here's the problem with church. We have found out the hard way. You can't trust church people. Uh, you can trust me with John the Baptist. But I can't trust you with the real John. Uh, I can trust you with pastor, worship leader. But I can't trust you with Lester Ensley. Uh, I can trust you with my Bible carrying self. But I can't trust you with my oak cup in my back pocket. There's a side of me that you can't really handle the truth. I'm looking for some people who I can be real with and do not judge me. I want to be able to tell you that I'm having trouble with God. I want to tell you that I'm about to lose my mind. I want to tell you that this burden is too much to bear. I want to tell you that I couldn't sleep last night. I want to tell you that I'm trying to be holy, but I fail every now and then. I need to be real with you I need you to turn to your neighbor and ask them can I be real with you can you handle the fact ask your neighbor can you handle the fact that I've got the Bible in my hand and some Hennessy on my shelf Because when the one don't work, I reach for the other one. I just need to know, can you handle the real me? Watch this now. He can be real with these two guys, but here's the real thing. When these two disciples found out that John is struggling with Jesus, notice what they do with it. They go right to Jesus. You missed it. When he shares with them his real self, the only thing that they do with it, they go right to Jesus. Okay, one more time. Three is a charm. When he takes the mask off and shows what's underneath the rope, they don't go tell anybody else. They go to Jesus. That's what you need in your life. Some people that know how to get right to the throne room of God and call on the Lord on your behalf. Here's what's happening in our circles today. You've got friends with the wrong skill sets. You've got friends that can do the wrong things. If you are in a hard place and you want to go out to the club and drop it like it's hot, You've got someone that you can call right now. That one is down for the get down. You will meet, he will meet you at the club and stay there until it shuts down. You've got somebody with that set skills. You've got somebody right now that when life is hard, if you needed to call on them to help you smash somebody's windows, they've got your back all day long. You've got some gangsters in your life that will show up with a sporty on and say, let's do what we've got to do. You've got somebody with that skill set. If you wanted to do something in the dark, you've got somebody that you can call right now who will show up at your place two o'clock in the morning because they got that skill set. But that's not what you need when life is hard. You need some prayer warriors who you can call on and tell them, I need you to pray for me. And you, and you know that when they go on their knees, lift up their hands and talk to God on your behalf. Tell your neighbor, that's what I need. You need people. Some people who knows how to pray. You need some people who knows how to go to the Lord. Because there will be some moments where you will not know. How to pray as you should. Have you ever knelt down and didn't know what to say? Have you ever bowed your head and felt unworthy to talk to God? And in that moment, I'm so glad somebody had me on their mind. The last thing you need to find fulfillment in the praise of others. Fulfillment in the praise of others. Here's what hinders many people when life is hard. You only praise God on your own stuff. 
Listen now. John is in a hard place. It's in the text. When Jesus finds out that John needs help, Jesus opens the eyes of some other blind people. Yeah. Let me try again. When John is in a hard place, and Jesus knows that John needs some help, Jesus causes some lame brother to get up and walk. When John needs some help, Jesus finds a sick sister and heals her. When John needs help, Jesus blesses John by blessing someone else. Because he wants John to know, don't limit your praise to God based on your own personal stuff. I'm going to surround you with people whom I've been good to. And I want you to learn to bless God for blessing your neighbor. I want you to get happy because the sister sitting next to you is happy. I want you to lift your hands because the brother in front of you lifted his hands. When the Lord sees you in a hard place, he will surround you with those that he's been good to as a way of encouraging you. And then you will know if God to, could do it for them and if God to, could open her eyes and if God could pay his bills and if God could heal her cancer and if God could protect his children and if God brought that family through the loss of their father, then surely God is able to do the same for me. Have you ever noticed that when you're in a hard place, this is now for people that attend church. Have you ever noticed that when you're in a hard place, the ushers always seat you next to sister shout a lot. <laughs> Have you ever come to church and you've been in a bad mood, trying to work some stuff out with God, and the brother, brother stand up is right in front of you? Have you ever come to church and you're in a hard place and you sit next to that sister that when they say touch your neighbor, she touches you 30 times. The Lord says, I'm trying to place you in a crowd of people that I've been good to so that you can gain some strength in your time of weakness. They will strengthen you. The church will support you, Sharice. They will hold your hands up. They will cry with you. They will laugh with you. I have placed them there so that you won't have to go through this alone. I'm still with you, says the Lord. I still care for you. I'm still on your side. When life is hard, you need a faith that is firm in days of disappointment. You need friends who are faithful witnesses of God's wonders. And you need to find fulfillment in the praise of other people. God bless. Amen. Yeah, I think let's stand and thank God for that beautiful word. Thank you, Pastor Lester. Wow. While every head is bowed and every eye closed, is there anybody here tonight because of the life of Ash that you need Jesus in your life? You can see how good God has been and you want to turn your life around. I want you to just slip up your hand quickly. We're going to pray for you. Thank you so much. Those are lifting up hand. Just lift your hand. We're going to pray quick for you. Just lift your hand. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for those hands. My God, we bless your name. While you are standing there, I want you to quickly come to the front. Quickly come to the front. And the church and the congregation clap their hands because at the memorial service of Ashwin McCain, the death of Ash, there's life for somebody here tonight. Come on, keep on clapping your hands as they come. Oh God!
Don't feel embarrassed. It's just a step of faith. You come, you come, you come to Jesus. He can turn your life around. You're never too bad to be good. God is able to do it here tonight. Oh yes, He is. Oh yes, He is. Thank you so much. Keep on clapping. Keep on clapping. Thank you, Jesus. While every head is bowed and every eye closed, the congregation, stretch your hands forward. I'm going to ask Pastor Leon James just to lead these people to Christ this evening. You can come up here, sir. Thank you so much, Pastor James. Hallelujah. God is still in the saving business. Hallelujah. has reserved this day for you. This is your moment and your day for your life to be changed. Won't you say this prayer after me while the congregation just stretch their hands to everybody. Repeat this prayer after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I thank you now for this moment, for this time that with my own mouth I can confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Right now, I believe with my heart that he died, but on the third day, he arose. And so today, I make this confession. Jesus, you are my Lord and my Savior. I thank you now for making me a child of God in Jesus name Amen and Amen God bless you as you have made that confession thank you so much